the mighty RMS Aquitania, for her time one of the largest ships in the world. This monstrous liner weighed close to 50,000 tons and was nearly as long as three football fields. She was a floating town with room enough for 3,200 people. Now, for 1913, these kinds of numbers were very impressive, but none of it would have been possible without a much, much smaller kind of craft to help out. The tugboat, small in size but hugely powerful. For decades, these vessels have guided ships in and out of harbours around the globe, working around the clock to safely tend to much larger ships. In Aquitania's day, the tug was absolutely pivotal. But then the technology was simple and fairly crude. You might need five or ten or more tugs for a single ship. Today, things are much, much different. Tugboats can turn on a dime. They aren't just little boats with powerful engines anymore, they're insanely expensive pieces of cutting edge technology capable of pulling off incredible maneuvers by themselves from docking monumental bulk carriers many times bigger than Aquitania to towing vessels dead in the water which are dozens of times their own size. Tugboats are the hero vessels that keep the shipping world going. But there was once a time when tugboats were little more than a novelty and the idea had actually struggled to catch on. It took a few visionary inventors decades to prove that the idea had legs and tugs could change the game and change the game they truly did. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to look at how the tugboat was invented. Before the Industrial Revolution transformed ships forever, sails and oars were the only way people could go any significant distance. Mighty sailing ships ruled the waves. Magnificent galleons and fat, heavily laden trade ships bound for the East Indies. There was just one problem. Ships were huge, and they had no easy way of coming in and out of port. It meant that larger vessels had to remain at anchor and rely on smaller craft like cutters or gigs to ferry passengers and cargo to shore. The docking process was a complex and awkward affair, and it often just came down to good old-fashioned elbow grease. See, ships couldn't just sail right up into the docks, with momentum behind them, even if the crew reefed the sails at exactly the right moment, the vessel was likely to smash straight into the pier at speed. Instead, the headway needed to be dropped far enough away from the docks so that a safe approach could be made. But with sails furled, there was no easy way to sail into port. Instead, the crew needed to put their backs into towing their own ship. The boats would be got away, and then lines were rigged, and the men just needed to row. It was slow going and very hard work. Think of the opening scene of Les Miserables, where dozens of men are toiling away to tow and dry dock a ship. This was just everyday life for generations, and even then it only worked for ships of around 200 tons. Anything bigger than that proved virtually impossible to manhandle into position. So they would sit at anchor for days and days while small boats zip back and forth to resupply them. Then there came a technological breakthrough that changed everything and would one day go on to save a lot of ship's crews some backbreaking labour. In the 18th century, for the first time, boats began to be driven by steam engines. They were small and fairly awkward things, because steamships wouldn't come for some time yet. These early steamboats were little more than engineering novelties. We're now used to the idea, but back then the sight of loud boats with smokestacks pouring smoke was almost comical. They were, for the longest time, considered little more than toys for the rich or prototypes for boffins and mad inventors. For those boffins and mad inventors though, the practical applications were pretty obvious. Enter Jonathan Hulls of Gloucestershire, England. In 1736 he had a radical idea. What if a paddle driven steamboat could tow a sailing ship into port? It's pretty impressive stuff given Hulls drew up his idea some 33 years before the birth of Napoleon. This was truly cutting edge technology. Hulls was a dreamer, but sadly he didn't live to witness the realization of his idea and it stayed on the drawing board. But then years later, in 1801, somebody finally tried to pull his idea off. The Charlotte Dundas was a small paddle steamer that used a horizontally mounted steam engine in a very simple arrangement. In 1803, on its first voyage, the ship showed its merits when it chugged ahead through a powerful breeze when every other vessel in the canal had stopped. But crucially, the feat was accomplished while the Charlotte Dundas was hauling two 70-ton canal barges behind her. Now, the concept of the towboat was proven dramatically, and it was an impressive start, but then the project's benefactor died and the idea lost momentum. 
Frustratingly, the concept of the functional load towing boat was again shelved and the valiant little vessel was eventually broken up. Now while the Napoleonic Wars raged on, some other dreamers and doers began to scheme. One was Richard Trevithick, a British engineer and a real pioneer in the early days of steam power. He had a vision in mind of a dedicated boat designed to attend other larger ships. Powered by steam, it would go a long way to helping ships in and out of port. He called his idea the nautical labourer. He had bigger and grander ideas for the boat too. If it could carry steam pumps and machinery, she could fight fires or load heavy cargoes. It was a great idea, but it stalled on the drawing board and never took off. On that one, Trevor Thick was truly too far ahead of his time. It seemed that steamboats were little more than newfangled gadgets with very little practical purpose. But then in 1814, something interesting happened. On the Tyne River at Newcastle, England, an early steamboat, creatively named the Tyne Steamboat, was built to act as a kind of passenger vessel. But the venture failed after two years of poor ticket sales and the boat was put on the market. Now fortunately, it was bought by a clever entrepreneur named Joseph Price, who had a totally different purpose in mind for the old Tyne Steamboat. First, he thankfully diced the old name and renamed his boat Perseverance. Then in the summer of 1818, he pulled off an experiment. He later wrote, At the time appointed, I requested him to throw a line on board the steamer. The tide was against us the first three miles. Everything answered as well as I could wish. The vessel was towed two miles over the bar in two hours and ten minutes, a distance of 13 miles, the wind against us all the way. This was the first time a sailing vessel was ever towed by a steamboat. Now this was the kind of breakthrough moment the towing vessel had needed all along. It was so successful that Price put another old passenger steamer into service, converted just to tow other vessels on the Tyne, and within three years there were 14 other boats like this operating in the river. Slowly the idea began to catch on across Britain. In London, an early steamer, the Majestic, was tasked with towing an East Indiaman sailing ship into Woolwich from Deptford. It was only about 5 miles or a little over 8 kilometres, but there, in front of the curious and watchful eyes of London citizens, Majestic thundered down the Thames and did the job with ease. Then, another steamship did the same thing in Liverpool. Clearly, this technology had huge ramifications, but this new class of towing boat didn't yet have a name. It was about to get one though. In 1817, a Scottish yard in Dumbarton built the first steamship designed specifically to tow other ships. Like the others, she too was driven by a powerful steam engine and a paddle wheel. She was simply named Tug. Well, clearly the idea and the name caught on because pretty soon tugboats began to pop up in all the major British and European ports. In fact, there were so many tugboats that their chugging engines and thick black smoke became a source of criticism for many, with one going so far as to tell Price his invention had ruined the port. Noise and smoke aside, the new boat, now collectively known as the tugboat, had absolutely changed the game. First and foremost, it meant that for the first time, ships as large as 400 tons could dock where previously they couldn't hope to make it. In the past, sailing ships that large had to simply moor and ride at anchor while supplies were ferried to and fro in small boats. Now they could simply be towed by steam tugs up the river and into the docks where they could be loaded and unloaded with relative ease in just a fraction of the time. Not only that, but previously, sailing ship captains had often been incredibly frustrated by poor conditions in port when the wind might drop off for days on end. It meant they were often stuck there until a breeze could come up at just the right direction and strength to carry their ship out of port. But now, with the advent of the tugboat, they could simply be towed out of the harbour into more open waters where breezes would be stronger. It meant the ships could spend less time in port and complete more profitable voyages. In fact, the number of annual around-the-world voyages a ship could reliably do actually went up by about 60%, which was an incredible jump. Early on, in those early days, the towing business was cutthroat. In the time, Joseph Price had pioneered the idea with perseverance, but then dozens of competitors sprang up. It resulted in bizarre scenes as competing tugboat captains would race against one another at full speed to an incoming ship just to try to win the towing contract. When towing jobs weren't available, captains would pull off simple small cargo hauls or even ferry passengers where they needed to go, operating somewhere between a U-Haul and an Uber. As the 1830s and 1840s rolled in, ships began to increase in size and then they began to be made out of iron. This was a huge jump in technological innovation because it meant ships could be made bigger and stronger 
but they would need more tugs, and even then the tugs needed to be bigger and stronger too. Tugs had until then always been made out of wood, and that had to change. In 1841, the first iron hull tug, Defiance, was introduced and brought many distinct advantages. First and foremost, it was significantly stronger than its wooden forebearers, but was surprisingly a little bit lighter. In time, paddles began to be replaced with propellers, but paddle-wheeled steam tugs still stayed in service well into the 20th century. In fact, one of the last to be built was completed in 1914. The reason for their longevity was because of the paddles. If you ran one in reverse and the other one ahead, the boat could essentially turn on the spot, something propeller-driven vessels just couldn't do. Today, tugboats are almost unrecognisable from their earliest days. They feature powerful thrusters which can swivel through all 360 degrees. They boast immense power to weight ratios, in fact, most huge ships coming into and out of ports only need three or so of these types of craft to help them. It's an amazing story of success for a vessel that, for about 81 years from 1736 until 1817, was seen as little more than a toy. Price had introduced the world's first tugboat on the River Tyne. It's fitting that one of the two surviving British paddlewheel tugboats left was built on the Tyne as well. Eppleton Hall was one of the last of her kind, introduced in 1914. After a long career, she was laid up and sold to the scrappers in the 1960s, but fortunately, renowned maritime figure Carl Cortum, founder of the San Francisco Maritime Museum, stepped in to save it. She was rebuilt and made the remarkable voyage across the mighty Atlantic Ocean under her own power. Today, Eppleton Hall is moored in San Francisco, one of the last of her kind, a relic from a bygone era, and a reminder that there was once a time when the idea of towing ships with a steamboat was radical in and of itself. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.